the last time you heard a really good story? Maybe it was a TV show that made you dream of discovering aliens as a kid or book that completely changed how you think about yourself. We are all hardwired to make sense of the world by telling and being told stories. And at the turn of the 20th century, motion pictures were starting to do just that. At first, seeing just any film was thrilling. Whether it was Vadville a performer flexing his muzzle or a train pulling up to a station. But just 5 or 6 years into the history of film, audiences were looking for something more than just a technological marvel. So filmmakers had to try to make people not just see but to feel. The world was primed for artists to prove this medium was more than just a passing fact. And along came a storyteller who would make his own magic, take us to the moon and jumpstart the first special effect revolution. He changed what filmmaker and audiences believed was possible both on screen and off. Hello, I am Sudhindra SG and in today's FTII workshop on history of film, in the seventh episode, we are going to discuss about George Milius, one of the world's first visual storyteller. <laughs> As the 19th century gave way to the 20th, artists, engineers and self-taught tinkerers were all pushing the boundaries of film. Technical innovations like the Latham loop allowed filmmakers to use longer film strips in cameras without them tearing and breaking. Now they could create longer, more complex films which facilitated the very first experiments with editing. Editing, also known as cutting, is the assembling of shots to achieve coherence. Whether that's in the narrative, in space, in time, symbolically or thematically. There are all kinds of ways to join shots together. You can use transition like fades, wipe or dissolves or you can just cut straight from one shot to another like this. See that? We will explore editing techniques in more detail later in our FTI history series and dive deep into their psychological, emotional and even political implications. For now, all you need to know is that filmmakers were starting to join shots together, inching their way towards narrative based films and explicitly to tell stories. Mary George Jean Milius was born on December 8, 1861 from a family of wealthy bootmakers. He started his education at the Lissy Michelet until it was bombed during the Franco-Prussian War. After that, he went to the prestigious Lissy Louis Le Grand. After he graduated, Milius seemed destined to pursue his family business of shoemaking until his father sent him to London to work as a clerk. There he often visited the Egyptian hall where he developed a lifelong passion for magic. When he returned to France, he hoped to study painting at the Ecole des Beaux Arts. But his father refused to support him as an artist. So he kept working at the shoe factory. Nevertheless, he harbored his love for magic by regularly attending performances at the theatre Robert Houdin in Paris as well as making magic lessons. Eventually, he became talented enough to perform at the renowned Cabinet Fantastic at the Grevin Wax Museum. Finally, in 1888, when his father retired, he sold his share of the shoe business to his brothers and use the money to buy the theatre Robert Houdin which had been suffering from low attendance. He then spent the next nine years renovating it by introducing 13 new illusions that he had invented. His most famous one was perhaps the recalcitrant decapitated man which featured a man who didn't allow a simple decapitation get in the way of telling his story. It is also during that time that Milius met performer Jahania Dialki who quickly became his mistress and muse. Thanks to his efforts, the theatre's attendance drastically improved and Milius was now able to hire the great illusionist of his time such as Buter de Colta. But his success meant that he was now relegated to the backstage to direct, produce, write, design, set and costumes as well as invent many of his performance tricks. And while he surely missed the spotlight, this was crucial in allowing him to build the necessary skills to later become a successful director. On December 28, 1895, Milius attended a private demonstration of the Lumiere Brothers cinematograph, an early version of the modern camera and the projector. Milius immediately offered them 10,000 francs for the camera but they refused as they foolishly believed there was no future in camera and wanted to keep it as a pure scientific tool. Not discouraged, Milius travelled to London to purchase an animatograph 
which he soon reverse engineered into a working camera, thus allowing him to project his own movies in his theater by May 1896. In the autumn of that same year, an event occurred that would change the face of cinema. While filming a bus, Millier's camera jammed, which took him a few minutes to repair. The time the camera started working again, the bus was replaced with a hearse, and he didn't think much of the accident until he developed the film and realized how the magic of cinema allowed one to make object disappear and transform. He understood that cinema had the capacity to distort time and space to create illusions. In short, he had discovered editing and special effects. Now, to be fair, Edison had already. Use that effect in the execution of Mary Stott, but it would be in Millier's hands that special effect reached their true artistic purpose. For example, he invented the first double exposure, going as far as using seven multiple exposures at once for the one-man band. He invented the first split screen, which he did by blocking one side of the camera lens, filming, and then reusing the same strip of film while blocking the other side of the camera lens. And he also invented the first dissolve or even the first graphic manipulations. Throughout his career, Melius kept his ingenuity and creativity to build intricate. Scenes that brought the illusions he performed on stage to a whole new level. At the end of 1896, Millius founded the Star Film Company, one of the first film studios in history. He built a studio in his Montreal property on the outskirts of Paris. It was made entirely of glass, as to allow enough light for the camera, and enabled Millius to produce 78 movies in the first year alone. And as he did for his theater, he worked tirelessly in, in every aspect of the production. Whether it was set design, writing, camera work, coming up with new special effects, acting, and so much more. At first, his movies included a wide range of styles, from documentaries to on-camera magic tricks to even pornographic material. But by 1898, after more than 130 movies, it was clear to Millius that his true calling was. The fantastical. By then, his rate of production had drastically lowered to only 27 movies, but each movie was more complex and intricate than the last. This allowed him to direct some of the greatest pieces, such as the very first horror movie in history, *Robbing Cleopatra's Tomb*, which depicted Cleopatra as a mummy. It's also during that time he directed the first of his many satirical religious films, which showed a statue of Jesus Christ on the cross turning into his seductive mistress Jehandialki. In 1899, he made two of his most ambitious movies: the very controversial *Affair Dreyfus*, which discussed the case of Jewish officer. Alfred Dreyfus, who had been falsely framed and accused of treason by his superiors, this case was extremely problematic in France as it brought to the spotlight the rampant anti-Semitism that reigned in Europe much before the Nazis. Millius was pro Dreyfus and showed him in a sympathetic light, which resulted in numerous physical fights during the film screening until the police censored it. Later that year, more than half a century before Walt Disney, Millius made the first movie adaptation of Cinderella, a six-minute-long movie featuring 35 actors and above all, multiple tableaux, better known as scenes, which contrasted with the fixed backgrounds that's been used until then. This movie was Millier's call to fame as it became widely popular in both Europe and United States. However, Thomas Edison, being Thomas Edison, resented Millier's success as it impeded on the monopoly he had held on film production until then. He attempted to have Millier's movies forbidden from being screened in the U.S., but Millier retaliated by creating a syndicate which would protect the foreign interests of French movie makers. And so, it was through this growing international popularity that he continued creating greater and greater pieces of art. He became especially interested in using perspective in order to make characters and objects change in size, an effect that would be used more than a century later by Peter Jackson in The Lord of the Rings. This is best shown in his movie, The Man with the Rubber Head, which required an intricate trolley system that Millier, of course, designed and built himself. This, along with all the other illusions he had perfected throughout the years, would be used in making his masterpiece film, A Trip to the Moon, Melius instant 1902 classic. It was loosely based on From Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne, yet another French visionary. The movie is widely considered the first science fiction film ever, and is simply spectacular. Which is, while it is not his most technical piece. 
It embodies everything that made him so great. Beautiful set design, the intricate costumes, the elaborate effects, the story which doesn't take itself too seriously, the sense of wonder and adventure as one would have back then just dreamed about when they looked at the moon and were just dreaming about what was lying there. This feeling of a captured dream that is present in so many of Billy's movies, it's just so charming. It is strongly recommended to be watched by everyone, even today. He had even went as far as having each frame painstakingly painted in order to make his first color movie. At 14 minutes long and costing 10,000 francs to produce, the movie was a smashing success especially in the US. But unfortunately, Milius didn't get to enjoy most of his international success as film producers such as Sigmund Lubin and Thomas Edison made a fortune by selling illegal copies of his movies. This disregard for his copyright was so blatant that they started collecting royalties from other companies for using the movies they had stolen from Milius. It was outrageous. As a result, Milius partnered with his brother Gatson, whose shoe business had been falling, in order to open a studio in New York with the promise of aggressively fighting counterfeiters. Nevertheless, Milius didn't allow this to stop his artistic ambition as he directed in the following year The Kingdom of the Fairies, which critics have called undoubtedly his best film and in any case the most intensely poetic. And from this he rode on a wave of constant success and increasingly made ambitious movies. In 1904, he made a sequel of his famous A Trip to the Moon called The Impossible Voyage, which at 24 minutes long was considered yet another success. He also kept expanding his Montreal studio by adding electric city, buying new costume and building a whole new set. But just a year later, his popularity started to waver. His fairy style that he was known for was growing less and less popular and so Millis was forced to try new genre films such as crime films. Nevertheless, that didn't stop declining sales and he was forced to cut the prices of all his movies by 20%. By 1907, critics had started to note that his movies awkwardly balanced between a repetition of old formula on one hand and an uneasy imitation of new trends on the other. In 1908, his film studio Star Film Company was pressurized into joining Thomas Edison's motion picture patents company under threat of being sued for patent infringement, otherwise as Edison held most patents related to cinematography. Under the terms of his contract, Millius was forced to supply 1000 feet of film per week. Obviously, such a rush for production meant that the quality of his movies significantly deteriorated. Nevertheless, he was still able to direct some masterpieces. For example, he made Humanity Through the Ages, a pessimistic tale of the history of mankind. While he was extremely proud of this movie and remained proud of it throughout his lifetime, it was a big commercial failure. Two years later, Milius made a deal with famous film distributor Charles Pathé in exchange for a large sum of money to produce and direct movies. Pathé held the rights to distribute and edit them. He also held the right to Milius' home and Montreal studio. This deal would come to destroy Milius' career in future. In 1911, he produced two extremely ambitious, ferocious movies and while these would have been widely popular just a decade prior, but they were now expensive failures. The following year, he produced his longest movie ever with the 44 minute long The Conquest of the Pole based on the recent expedition to the poles by Robert Perry and Roald Amundsen. Again, the movie was a big financial flop. One of his later attempts was made in 1912 and was a retelling of his immensely popular Cinderella movie. The movie was almost one hour long which was incredible considering the fact that film was just two decades old but Pathé massively edited it down to just over 30 minutes and it was still a flop. After a couple of more similar flops, Milius decided to break his contract with Pathé. Meanwhile, his brother Gatson in the US was in no better off as he had decided to travel through Asia to film documentaries. However, the films were often damaged while they were sent back to his studio in New York, unable to fulfill the obligation of Thomas Edison and having lost $50,000 or almost $1.3 million in today's 
rate, he was forced to sell his film studio in 1930. He returned to Europe and died only two years later, having never spoken to his brother Milius again. With the death of his brother, Milius was now severely indebted to Pathé. And with the advent of World War, Pathé was unable to take possession of his studio. But it didn't change much as Milius was too bankrupt to produce anything. Not that he wanted to stop production, but because of the horrors of the war and the divide that he had built between his brother and him, he was finally able to break his seemingly unwavering desire to make movies. The final straw occurred in 1913 when his first wife Eugene died which left him alone with a 12 year old child Andre to rise. His theatre was also shut down by the war and the French army had turned his Montreal studio into a military hospital as well as confiscated his 400 films melted down to make shoe heels for the army. In 1923 the theatre Robert Houdin was torn down to build a Boulevard houseman and that same year Pathé was able to take over star films and the Montreal studio. In a fit of rage, Milius decided to burn his costume, set and above all, all his movies. Which as a result, we have lost most valuable works of Milius. But fortunately, through extensive research, over 200 of his movies has been rediscovered. However, it is very less compared to the 500 movies he directed throughout his career. And we must come to accept that many of those have been truly been eternally lost. In 1925, Milius married his longtime mistress Janet de Alki, but by then he was mostly forgotten and financially ruined as the couple barely scrapped by operating a small candy and toy stand in the railway station in Paris. But fortunately, Milius had started to be rediscovered again. As the year prior, the journalist George Michael Koziak interviewed him for a book on the history of cinema. In it, Koziak hoped to underline the importance of French pioneers in the early days of cinema. In 1926, following the success of Koziak's book, the magazine Cine Journal was asked to publish his memoirs, which further bolstered Milius' newfound or rather refound prestige. Throughout the end of the 20s. More and more journalists took interest in him and eventually a gala of appreciation was made on December 1929. Milius described this as one of the most brilliant moment of his life. On October 1931, he was made a Chevalier de la Gée d'Honneur, the highest honor in France. The medal was presented to him by no other than Leo Lumiere who called Milius the creator of cinematic spectacle. Perhaps an admission that he was wrong to not sell him the camera more than 30 years ago. An admission that while Yumiya brothers had invented the camera, Milius had invented cinema. But this newfound fame did little to alleviate his poverty and in a letter to a friend he admitted, Lucky enough I am strong and in good health but it is hard to work 14 hours a day without getting my Sundays or holidays in an ice box in winter and a furnace in summer. Milius died because of poverty and cancer on May 21st, 1938 at the age of 76. So, George Milius, the Parisian stage magician who brought science fiction, special effects and more sophisticated narrative storytelling to film was ultimately honored by those who knew his work the best. Both his peers and his rivals agreed that his illusions changed history and took audiences to new and thrilling places. Today, a recent 2012 film, Hugo, is based on the life history of George Milius and never missed to watch it. Today, we introduce George Milius, the magician turned filmmaker, whose mistakes, experiment and ambitious storytelling led to some huge advancement in early film production. We discussed how editing and special effects can enhance the very nature of film as an illusion and how audiences were hungry for longer, more complex narratives. And next time, we will learn about some experimentation with editing technique and a filmmaker who started to define the visual language of film as we know it today. Thank you.